I'm actually concerned I'm not going to be able to hear you. Well, why would oh. you be concerned about that? Yeah, the noise floor on your mic is so low, I heard absolutely nothing until you said hi. That oh. is because I spent too much money on this microphone. Just too much money. We're almost at episode 20. I think this is 19. Okay, that's, well that's then, tw- okay, so that's... if we do 20, $20 an episode. I think that's probably worth it. Well, listen, it's going to be. No also, science. there's all my meetings, right? You know, I I sound very professional. It's very fun to take therapy, to do therapy with a microphone. Because <laughs> you sound like the therapist. She, uh, yeah. my therapist, uh, shout out to Megan. Has, Hi, Megan. <laughs> like, saying uh, she 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 is not a friend of the show she does not engage with any of my content anywhere which is the correct oh yeah i would imagine that's probably a good call yeah yeah boundaries or whatever but uh (laughs) (laughs) oh man you're gonna love this okay uh no i'm just kidding just kidding i I don't have any funny stories i have hopped on before and she's like oh hello welcome to the megan and daniel show there you go i'm like yeah today we've got our recurring guest childhood trauma come on down everybody a a podcast series or uh, maybe it was a release of recreated episodes for a tv show of a therapist in their meetings wasn't that a show Uh, maybe i'm miss (laughs) <laughs> that does not sound like a show. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I have price therapy if we can live stream our sessions. <laughs> yeah, Megan, let's go live on TikTok, and I'm not paying out of pocket this time. Searching for TikTok on the App Store. No. Oh, no. What is happening? Siri, your name is not Megan. <sighs> Can't win them all. I've had a stressful week around this house with all these storms rolling through. I was sitting on the... Uh, Let's see, three days ago, sitting on my couch with popcorn, my dog, watching a show, I don't even remember, and drip, nice singular drop of water right on my shoulder from the A-frame part of my roof, and now I'm worried, I'm very worried. Something's leaking? Yes. Did I send you the video of the small waterfall that was in my mudroom? No, you did not. Yeah, we also experienced some leaking. Oh, no. Do you have a sump pump? We do have a sump pump. Okay. I've got a bunch, and they're like... You've got a I, bunch I, of I've sump I've literally pumps. set them up so that they're ready for rapid deployment and battery power if I need. Yeah, because uh, one year, it's been a while, but one year, the way the my backyard is arranged, it's it's kind of hilly. And we're not the... It, this location's not at the very bottom of the hill, but it's it's... In the route of uh, a house. Yeah, it's in the middle. Higher. You've definitely just yeah. built a ramp for water to come pretty much into your... Pretty much. And so that ramp works great as long as there aren't leaves in the way to clog up and stop the flow, which is exactly what happened one year. And thank God I was home because uh, it all it took was me getting out there and like scraping away this section of pile up against a fence that had yeah created a, a backlog of water that absolutely 100 percent would have come in to the a-frame living room floor level if i hadn't have jumped out there it was uh it was intense and scary but uh a few times leading up to that before i really figured out what the problem was the basement would occasionally get water coming down the steps and would flood so you have a basement <laughs> yes I do. You didn't give me the basement tour. You just gave me the <laughs> main floor. It's tour. just a, it's not like a finished. It's not as fancy as yours. It's a, it's a, yeah, it's just a basement um, that normally is very dry. In fact, I haven't had those issues since. As, as soon as I fixed the problem, and of course, I bought all the probably five sump pumps. Uh, I haven't yet for the non to use them. Uh, minor area of the East Coast that has sub pumps. I had no idea what a sub pump was before I moved to Baltimore. And they're like, here's your sub pump. It's dirty. It needs to be serviced. Uh, yeah. We just need to make sure there's cleaning it. I'm like, I don't know. What What are you talking about? What is a sub pump? Yeah. No, I uh, pretty much every house that I lived in because I was so active recording loud bands, I would always live in the basement. And recording has a lot of very expensive equipment. So I learned that lesson real fast. Uh, get a good sump pump and get a nice battery backup for it because the sump pump doesn't do you a lot of good if it's a really bad storm and it's knocked out the power then you just feel helpless there was one day i uh this is when i lived in old town herb good old herb my landlord who was a creep uh 
okay. I was just sitting there mixing a song and I heard like, man, it's really raining out there. It sounds like it's raining inside it's so loud. It's like, that can't be. And I stand up and go to the other side of the, the room. And uh, yeah, the there's a one window that kind of has a, a hole like to let light in, but it's a basement level. So, you know, it had to be dug out or whatever. And that was having rain come off from the roof because the gutter was messed up straight down into that. And it was a flooding cascade of water into the basement. And I just, I spent hours out there with a freaking bucket and Herb was just standing there watching me because he was a very out of shape, older man who couldn't do anything, but just kept saying like, I'm, I'm you know, really sorry. <laughs> I don't know. And the next day I went to Home Depot and uh, got an uh, obscene amount of like coverings and various things to just make sure it never happened again. And then he got mad at me because he said it looked really bad. I was like, I don't care. <laughs> anyway, that was a slight detour about my introduction to sump pumps. If I just had one, I could have deployed right there. And you want you, them like you, rapidly able to be deployed, perfectly wound cables so you can just throw the thing, throw the hose, boom, let's do this. It's the best feeling in the world when you start to actually command water because uh, without that tool, yes, you, like Aquaman. you feel ho- helpless. Yes, I feel like Aquaman, right? Okay, so a sump pump is, it, it's basically just a pump that it, it's like a big shop vac that is permanently installed in your basement uh, in a lot of houses. in Or portable, like I mentioned. Yeah. yeah. Or you, you dig a hole into ones. the ground of your basements near the door usually. That's where the, there is one here. Is that what you have? Or no, we have, have one, one in there. our closet that okay. is permanently just in the ground and then has right. a has a hole that pumps it out into the alleyway. Yep. Anyway. Uh, but sometimes you get so much water that the pump can't keep up because there's only a certain number of gallons per minute or however they rate them. So it's, it's worth to have an extra one or two on hand just in case. Sam, I have a very serious question for you. Sure. Have you lived anywhere that doesn't have a sub pump? I mean, like, or or that hasn't been a part of. Is that a thing in Lynchburg, Virginia? Oh yeah, Do you it's need a thing. Yeah, anywhere in the Mid Atlantic kind of area. Yeah, I would I would imagine it's it's because it's the ground is generally pretty wet because there's always storms and if you just get this right combination of thunderstorms coming through, you'll get flooding. So yeah, I think I always have uh, uh, in terms of a basement, but I haven't always owned a sump pump. I don't even know if my mom has one, but yeah, you should buy your mom a sump pump. Happy Mother's Happy Day. Birthday. <laughs> Sump pump. Gift. Sump pump. It really is uh, sump pump. Uh, I asked repeatedly. And it's odd to me. It's so funny uh, to think about that one, people don't know the existence of a sump pump because they don't get enough rain or it doesn't need it. And two, that there are people that go their entire lives without having a basement in their house. It's so odd to me. It's a big country. But I know. I know. It's huge. A lot of, lot of stuff happening out Are basements in common in Europe in general? Is that a thing? A sub pump in Europe? No, no just or basements. basements. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean they were they were dug centuries ago yeah, okay. to be the refrigerator. Right. Okay, got it. I mean they're not in Amsterdam where I lived in Europe because you know if you dig another foot down you're in the Atlantic Ocean. Ah, uh, makes sense. So. so my neighbors actually, I looked into this, but it's I don't think I want to throw down the money. But they had installed. I think it's called a geothermal. Uh, heating and cooling system so it's fascinating to think about but it's only maybe 30 feet down into the ground before the temperature is so regulated that it basically never fluctuates it's always like i think i want to say 40 degrees or something like that and or maybe 50 degrees like always no matter what no matter what time of year so what they do is that they augment your hvac system with another system that gets dug into the ground and then circulates water uh, or yeah, I'm pretty sure it's water, not air. Uh, yeah. Water through pipes down there yeah. that like go through this little system that naturally uh, changes the water to the temperature that is steady underground. And so in the um, summer, when you want cooler air, that water is augmenting your a- AC so that it doesn't have to work as hard pulling like raw electricity off the grid to cool the air. And then in the winter, because like I said, it's like 45 or maybe 50 degrees, I think, um, when it drops to 30s, you're actually able to augment your heat, even though it's like 50 degrees, which isn't that warm, it's still offsetting uh, by like 20 degrees, how much heat is needed uh, from your electric or gas or whatever you use. It's a really fascinating system. It takes a while for it to to pay for itself, but certain regions, it's super viable. Uh, I'd be really curious if, if um, 
in a desert area, how, how far you'd have to dig and if it's uh, something worth looking into. But it was a big project. They had to, they, they were so sweet. They uh, were like, we're really sorry. Our yard's going to be really loud and under construction for a while. Here's a pamphlet about what we're doing and why. I was like, <laughs> oh, geothermal HVAC. This is awesome. A <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They, everybody in my neighborhood works for like Johns Hopkins or something. So they're either doctors or teachers. And so I think they're, they like to inform. <laughs> Let's put it that way. That's adorable. Uh, Teachers, I say that. They're like professors, not they're not working for the public school system, I don't think. You had a you 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 had a fun story about geothermal HVAC in there because I was about to be like, hey, what's up, what's up, what's up? I've got a question about places you've lived. Uh, <laughs> so I am I am uh, nostalgic at the moment for multiple places that I have lived because I'm planning a print wall in my home. Oh, and, nice. And and I'm trying to like figure out some sort of theme and color and whatever of uh, my own prints. And then I'm, you know, going to integrate a few friends prints around the house. But like we have one very big bare wall in our living room that is perfect for like a proper gallery wall of spending too much money getting too many gorgeous you prints. want them like framed up or are they going to be yeah. like collaged okay yeah cool. a, a, a nice a nice frame and then you know appropriate spacing among them i'm i'm a big i'm a big gallery wall guy if you remember my old office behind me i mentioned uh, this to elise i think she maybe was bringing it up or something have you are you familiar and if not uh or maybe even if you are we should describe what it is for somebody who might be listening that isn't Uh, One of the best techniques I've come across to uh, set up a gallery wall of multiple prints of multiple sizes and everything is to use wallpaper cut to the dimensions of you basically like put your frame on a piece of wallpaper, stencil it out, cut it out, and then you hang all the various properly sized footprinted wallpaper pieces on your wall to get the arrangement how you'd like. Is that something you've come across or do you have an even better technique for getting the placement of multiple p- photos together? Vibes. <laughs> what? My, my vibes. That's the oh, only. Oh, you just feel it just, as you I hang? Just, ooh, yeah. So like I, <laughs> I, I, I okay, have made many good. a gallery wall at this point. And so at this point I kind of like slap up three or four pieces in like the area that I know that I want them. And then smaller and just kind of like start wiggling uh, you know just wiggling but that's a totally viable thing i don't have good i don't taste know if it works of... as great for photography prints right so these are like illustrator prints designer prints that sort of thing not photographs okay. so these yeah. are going to be photographs so i'm going to have to be a little bit more intentional and it's also only going to be four or five photographs right so we'll have a photo from photo from Amsterdam, a photo from Oaxaca, a photo from Tulum, a photo from Montana, and probably a photo from Portland. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Cool. So five photos, I think. I don't know. This is very fly by the seat, seat, of, my, seat of my pants sort of thing. Um, when uh, uh, my partner's out of town right now, and so I am meandering my house looking for things to do, such as... <laughs> I should print a bunch of photos and hang them up here. Uh, And that has been a delight. But someone uh, a couple of days ago on Glass uploaded a photo of a very distinctive trailer hitch and like auto repair shop in inner Southeast Portland that was like two blocks from our old apartment. Like, oh, I have taken yeah. multiple photos of this same building. Oh, that I'm, would be so weird to see uh, just randomly on, like, yeah, s- yeah the internet. Yeah. That's freaky. Yeah. That's what happened to me when I was watching Sleepless in Seattle. Uh, it's like, whoa, <laughs> wait, that's Fell's Point. What's happening? <laughs> Amazing. Sorry, continue. That could be, no, that could be us. We could be uh, Sleepless in Seattle part has, two. Has Glass know? ever thought about uh, the integration or quick capability of sending something off for print? In, in uh, the, yeah, it's just not a, it's not a high value feature. Yeah. It's one that we would adore, but it's not like a, cause it's the not gonna resolutions make a, you support would be yeah, fine. Absolutely right? work. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you could never do that we keep, social media stuff. Not easily, but right. Like we get the question, why don't you have a, 
integration with Instagram where I can port over all my old Instagram photos. And it's like, well, cause they're 10 pixels by 10 pixels. Exactly. Right. Like, yeah. cause Instagram has compressed the hell out of theirs. There's no depth. There's no color left. There's nothing. You don't show the resolution size in the exit data though. That might be helpful. It would be ugly looking. I don't know how you present it, but I don't think people literally realize that it's uh, that high resolution unless they tap in. Yeah, it depends on like it depends on the viewport too cuz we we take the original file, you know, which will be usually a massive photo that someone's just exported from Lightroom or Capture One and then uploads it. We take that file, we keep that file, and then we make smaller versions of that file depending on who's calling it. So if the oh, iPhone gotcha. app is calling it, you get a smaller version than if the iPad app then on the web versus the full screen mode. So there are like four or five different sizes that we resize the photo to and then serve it depending on uh, cool. the instance. A uh, uh, bit of follow up, by the way, unless you have to continue this story, but I just want to make oh. sure, or we can circle back to this follow up as well. I just want to make sure it said, I did shoot about 50 headshots and I did use the one way mirror rig prototype. Okay, no, will you stop them. distracting me. I'm okay. like, we'll get 10, back to it. I just I'm like 10% to be... into this okay, question. Right. Keep, keep right. So I'm. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I uploaded my, uh, in 2014, uh, I shot a 365 project in inner Southeast Portland. It was beautiful and wonderful. Uh, and I realized a couple of days ago when I like pulled that entire year into my, uh, Lightroom to look for a photo of the car that the guy took in front of the trailer that I knew. I was like, I might've even taken a photo of this car. And then I just got lost, lost in the archive of like the 10,000 photos that I took that year. That's uh, so fun though. I love doing that. So, so I, I, I it got me, do. it got me very nostalgic for Portland, right? Even though this version of Portland doesn't exist anymore, it's long gone, right? Yeah. You know, like, the majority of the bars that some of the photos are in all closed multiple of like, Oh, here's a nice farmer's market. Yeah. That's condos now. Right. Like the, the, <laughs> the Portland that I loved is, is, has changed rapidly and it still exists, but it's also not the same, right? Like it's not what I had there. Um, and that's happened with, you know, pretty much everywhere I've lived except for like Amsterdam, right? Like Amsterdam is kind of, Amsterdam all the time. But even then, like this, the neighborhood yeah, I was living in was being gentrified out. rapidly, mm -hmm. right? Like when we moved in, it was a majority of non white, non Dutch or English speaking people. And by the time we were leaving, it was already starting to, and like, mm -hmm. oops, that was also our bad. We didn't know. We just grabbed a, <laughs> oops, uh, like we contributed to that gentrification. My bad. Uh, Anyway, but it is so, funny how when you're younger, you don't actually, it's like, you're not aware of that. It's, I mean, it's I was 30. <laughs> I just okay. didn't, I didn't know. Cause <laughs> so, I was just I moving know. to an international well, city. That's true. It's a completely different country. Like, it's even more difficult to, this is yeah, available. Sense. So yeah, I yeah, take yeah. it right. Like this, this is available for rent. I'm renting it. Oh no. I've that, accidentally the, raised that's the, the thing. I, price. I, like, like the places I lived when I was much younger, the, like the more of like the, luxury apartments that were just normal places <laughs> with the word luxury attached um were new and trying to be filled up and in areas that i had no previous sense of as far as like the history it's just you know they blinked all of these condos or apartments and uh, a couple of little shops to walk to into existence over the course of like a year and what was previously a completely different but thriving community uh was totally displaced and moved somewhere else uh, you know just pushed out of town it's uh but you know if you're coming from another country or another city generally like you said you just oh this place is in my budget and it looks nice and it feels safe we're good that's all you really think about i guess that's just how that works but Not i'm seeing it I it's, think about it's more. certainly but been on my mind a lot just seeing the rapid change in uh, the Fells Point area and Harbor East and just Baltimore in general. It's kind of crazy how many uh, projects are, yeah, just rapidly evolving. But so I am very I'm, excited about the new train station. Just I, I am curious. We can't make this a regional podcast about Baltimore, Sam. Okay. We can't. Right. No, we can't. <laughs> so I, I, I've noticed that I am, 10 years later, taking the same photos, right? Like I am 
uh, taking the same photo every time I go out, right? I, I my my photographic. Um, you mean after having looked through your ten thousand nostalgic older pictures, you yeah feel from nine that years ago, nine and a half years ago, perspective, the same exact things that you've forgotten that you took before, or it's like yes. what do you mean settings? So I mean like, like uh, how I frame a shot. So the the only thing that's different now from my twenty fourteen three sixty five project. Right. Uh, it was a lot of street photography, a few portraits peppered in the occasional self portrait. Right. Like same thing mm -hmm. I'm doing now with my glass profile. Right. Like mostly street photography, sometimes a little bit of nature or a little bit of time lapse, self portraits, people. Uh, and this the, the only difference that I can see between them is I'm able to get what I want faster and more like repeatably now than I did back then. Right. So like mm -hmm. I would take. Uh, I would take my camera out and I would walk for 20, 30 minutes every day, uh, usually on the way to lunch or on the way to like a happy hour or something. And I would take 10 to 50 photos in a day. And, you know, the the goal for a 365 project is one of those turn out, right? You know, I want, the, <laughs> I got yeah. my photo. Great. Let's, I'm done. Right. Cause like you don't want to keep going and, and <laughs> waste photos sure. effectively right which is counterintuitive but it is what it is to get the project done um but i'm noticing in those photos right so like eight thousand photos i am taking the same photos of doors or the same photos of like dark alleyways or the same photos of street art or the same photos mm -hmm. of trees power lines cars S solo parking cars hashtag solo parking uh i love it <laughs> and so <laughs> that's a thing i wasn't even aware that's a oh yeah that was a that was a big thing on 2013 instagram oh. hashtag solo parking it was like here's your van here's your vw van it's one of the reasons the oh, vw sure. van photos were those. popular yeah. on that yeah 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 you know uh <laughs> so how do you feel about that i mean i feel I, I, I feel pretty good about it. I think I might have a little bit more of a photographic style than I have realized, right? Because I have a style for portraits. That's my, right. I know that I have a style for portraits and I'm developing one for self-portraits, but I never really thought of like my street photography as a body of work or, or as a skill set that I've been developing so much as I thought I was just kind of wan wandering around taking photos. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, but 10 years later, I'm looking at these photos. I'm like, oh, these are almost exactly the same, <laughs> right? Like the, yeah. the, the editing was a little bit worse, right? You know, oops, <laughs> sorry. I was it's using that happens. Visco filters or whatever as yeah. my base, as opposed to totally rad actions in Photoshop. Or something. Oh God. I, I no. think, I think that's, um, totally normal. I think that all of us have a, uh, this is why, this is what makes photography, um, amazing is everyone has a certain thing that they gravitate toward photographing uh not just pure subject matter but shape of light or interesting texture or combination of colors that they gravitate to i bet you uh early on you like you said you were just going for a walk you weren't even conscious of it but i don't i'm not surprised at all i would think most people over the course of 10 years uh just get better and faster and more consistent and being drawn to something and photographing it really well in a way shorter span of time. I mean, I used to take uh, my clients for four hours uh, for one engagement session. I remember that was probably the longest <laughs> one I ever had, but it was, was about four hours. But I used to just keep shooting until I felt like I got what I needed. And that would always take a long time. That's too uh, many hours. Way too many. But the and I would take way more photos. Uh, and not because of the frames per second, the reason I intentionally and often do now, but because I, I just needed to, I felt. So now I can absolutely knock out an engagement session in one hour, maybe an hour and a half, and take a quarter of the pictures. And if I really needed to, uh, I could take even fewer than that if uh, if I wanted. But I like having the, it's just a vibe thing for me, the, uh, the feel of just the burst. It's just exciting. And actually, this was something mentioned uh, in a reel that I posted recently about uh, how important it is to, to kind of know when to take a knee, uh, to kind of lower yourself relative to your subject, especially uh, getting ready photos where people are like seated in chairs. It's so awkward to like the very first thing a client might experience from you 
photographing them is towering over them with a camera and they're seated in a chair. It has nothing to do with height. Anybody seated is generally going to be quite low. And it's just a more vulnerable feeling. And, and to now have this camera shoved in your face is really odd. There's a lot of discussion that we could actually talk about with the importance of knowing when to take a knee during a wedding, just so you're not, your ass isn't in someone's face like a guest. <laughs> that was my experience on the rare wedding I've attended. Could not believe the uh, videographer just planted directly in front of me uh, during a, a dance. And it's like, okay, fine. Yeah, whatever. It makes sense. Like do whatever for the shot. And people are forgiving in that way. So much so that if you do it and it's not something you've ever thought about, I guarantee you've annoyed people, but they're, they're letting it go because they don't want to ruin the couple's uh, video quality or, or photo quality. But you probably don't need to plant there and stay there the whole time. If you must be standing, uh, rotate out. Give someone else a view of your ass for a second. Like I just can't. It's in, in you are etched so in my mind about this. Because I was like, you're just standing right there. Worst case, like set up your tripod if you're video, and then take a knee. So at least it's the camera in the way. So uh, it doesn't matter. The point is, somebody commented saying, "Oh, and also shooting in silent mode is really important." And I was like, uh, "Hard disagree." The, there's something that happens uh, and it's unspoken and probably not even consciously like picked up on by the clients themselves. But when they hear the sound of your shutter, uh, and certainly uh, any professional model would, I think, also agree and relate to this. It, it's a signal of um, timing, reaction, and um, sort of excitement. It's an exciting thing to hear that burst of photos. And a line in a way, especially if somebody's in mid-laugh and you've caught them early enough that you're just like like kind of photographing that arc of someone's laugh when they hear that they respond to it and it just starts to create a nice little rapport with you and the person being photographed when you shoot in silence pure silence it's kind of awkward i mean this is why videographers who have always shot in pure silence uh tend to say things like action <laughs> so that people know that like the thing is happening the stuff is being documented that's not to say that silent shooting doesn't have a, a place and isn't really useful and important and something I've been actually doing a lot more uh, since having shot with the Z9 for so long, which doesn't have a mechanical shutter. And I really don't like the sound of the fake shutter that they have. It's mostly just silent shooting on that thing. And um, it's fine. But uh, the sound of the shutter one is, is also a really pleasing thing to experience as somebody creating something that's so nice yeah. to just have that in your hand and it's something that i was really critical of sony cameras early on all their early early generation mirrorless cameras had the most uh cringy shutter sound it was just like two pieces of plastic smacking together it just felt gross totally subjective maybe that felt great to the person that made the camera i don't know but it's uh something that's really important and if it's something you do a lot or professionally, I think it's worth thinking about. Like, how does the sound of the shutter actually make me feel? And it's one of the things I really loved about the R3 that I'm using. The R6 had a really great shutter. Nikon almost always had really nice shutter sounds. Um, so there's that aspect of it of just for you, but also again, like I said, just building this this kind of unspoken signal back and forth between you and the person you're photographing that things are happening. I mean, and, it's uh, pretty spoken. It's a pretty spoken signal, right? Like it, it, it can be. Yeah, noise means you can do something different with your face. <laughs> totally, right? and that, most that's people true. are nervous and stuff. Well, I just mean unspoken in a. Yeah. They were probably not thinking about it in the same way I just laid out, but it is something that people react to, even if it's unknown, like or, or not consciously thought of from them. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, so the, you're deep in your. You're, you're deep in your uh, website redesign still, right? And you're going back through your last decade sure, of photos. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, as soon as you started talking about that, I was like, yeah, can relate. I, have, I, you been, <laughs> have you been noticing the same photos that you've been taking? Or sure. have you have like have they you know because some of these for me they're like a little bit refined, right? I'm I'm a, I'm better at taking a photo of a car on a street now than I was, right? You know I. I used to take a direct, uh, mostly filling up the frame at a 45 degree angle, downward shot, hooray, and a, you know, head on, shitty Wes Anderson uh, centered. <laughs> Hello. Now I have a little bit more. 
Ooh, Je is this quoi. new movie out, by the way? Ooh, just, yeah, I like that that phrase. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm immediately, I need to Google if this new, new movie's out. Asteroid City is out. Come on, focus up. Oh, so. Yes. Okay, so, yes, I, um, for me, though, the most noticeable thing is the editing. And I really love my editing now. I feel like it's in a fantastic place with the uh yeah, just the baseline preset that I start with, the custom LUT that I spent forever working on, but has been a part of my preset now for years. Uh, it's just a great look. And so I've, I've gone through and started to re-edit some older work. One thing that's really fascinating to think about with editing is the evolution of screens, by the way. So, and this could probably tie in also to the discussion with the evolution of cameras and how that informs and will change how you shoot. Uh, certainly has for me in terms of comfort level, I'm much more dynamic with my shots now than I used to be because it's so much easier to get high and low with a flippy screen, which d didn't exist until yeah. what, 2018, the D850 was, I think, or 750. I can't remember. Yeah, the I mean, first you don't DSL need to know that. the model number. It's doesn't matter. recent -ish. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so uh, the editing, though, is where um, a lot of my most obvious evolution has, has occurred, for sure. And then just the overall knowing what I want even beforehand. I would also say that compositionally and in general, I have more clearly uh, emphasized shapes, like a really dominant uh, triangle or circle or square is almost in every shot that I make versus um earlier days that was still present but it was a little more hit hit and miss <laughs> all of the changes really come on the editing side i, I would say do you notice it's yourself kind of preferring different photos because like i i found a couple of days where i was like i remember that right you know my my project is still live on tumblr uh and it exists and i've looked at it i because of the theme i picked it was always a, um, yeah, you know, like it was always a horizontal photo instead of a portrait, you know, like couldn't sprinkle in any because of the theme, always horizontal, right? Like yeah. always. <laughs> I still gravitate toward that. I will say I used to love 16 by nine as a crop. Don't love it so much anymore. Uh, I think also one of actually, if there's a, a big downside to what I prefer and continue to and have no whole whatsoever to change this up but i really don't like shooting in portrait you know vertical orientation which is so nice on a phone which is sort of the dominant way everybody looks at photos now is on a vertical phone screen so it's uh it's interesting but oh going back to screens i didn't quite finish my point i ha i have realized that i think a lot of my preference in editing has been informed by the improvement in quality especially the the darkest uh, black points on screens becoming very, very, very dark versus years prior, uh, you know, early, mid 20 teens, the screens were very, not, you know, they had some contrast, but the black point was very high. So I would tend to set my black point on my tone curve to be um, just in a totally different spot now than I choose to now that I've got a beautiful liquid XDR display to edit from. And it's same with color temperature. You know, I've always, I used to before retina screens and liquid XDR used to calibrate my screens using like a spider thing and all yeah. of that. And people still fixate on that. I think way too much now than they need to, but with older screens, it was more necessary and I uh, would calibrate and you know, the, the offset of something being cooler on a screen means you're probably going to edit a little, what warmer, like to overcompensate if you have a then compared to a perfectly calibrated or a more modern screen. So a lot of my just colors, I have different preferences on when I'm editing. But again, I chalk that up to the evolution of uh, screens and their quality having improved so, so much. It's, it's all very fascinating, but it's something that is worth thinking about. And everybody's probably gone through it at some point when they get a new laptop or a new monitor. You're like, oh my gosh, everything looks so different now. I have to re-edit everything. I guess that's a normal thing. But it's funny to see it over time, over several different, because I used to update my computer every single year. That means I would go through a completely different screen every single year. That's one of the things I've really appreciated about Apple products, though, is that early on, it was very clear to me their screens were right out of the box, uh, much more, I don't want to say calibrated, because you still had to do some of that, but they were just, yeah, 
way more consistent within their ecosystem. And I still, as a spot check, I just check on my iPhone if, if it looks good there. Uh, I, and I don't hold it up to my screen to make sure the colors are perfectly matched at all or anything like that. But yeah, that's sort of the, the way to roll. God help you if you throw any of your photos up on a like giant LED TV, because I guarantee you're gonna hate the way they look. I, I thought you were gonna say Instagram. Instagram. Yeah, God <laughs> or Instagram. You put yeah, in I'm of sorry. Your photos. No, I've always been happy with my photos on Instagram. Yeah, I've never people. Maybe I've always had my little resize and sharpen action to be the appropriate size. So there's not. I've never picked up on any excessive compression happening to my Instagram, except for that one reel I uploaded once, where we were basically where like four we pixels. were potatoes. <laughs> Yeah, that was great. And that was a settings issue. It is funny, though. I do think ev pretty much everybody, because we are all uniquely drawn to a, a kind of almost a preset type of thing in the world to photograph based on what we've exposed ourselves to earlier and then our own just innate preferences of what somebody likes versus what they don't like in the world, you do hit a plateau pretty early on in terms of subject matter, unless you suddenly get access to some completely new thing to photograph, obviously, that you you know really like or whatever. Um, but you do hit a plateau of, of how what you're drawn to and, and how you photograph that you will evolve and change. It just happens much, much slower than in the first few years of your career. So where things, like I said, can evolve much more rapidly still is, is in editing. And um, that's, I think, why I answered it the way that I did for you. But I love that. It is really fun. Now, where I get into trouble is because I've never uh, deleted any raw file that I've taken ever. Uh, I, ever? If I, yeah, if I oh. punch open and look at all the unflagged, that's where I get into trouble of, ooh, actually, mm, maybe I like this one a little bit better. Do I just completely hit eject on the, the one that's been on my website for five years and use the slightly other version? Yes. Then of you start you opening. Do. Yeah, but then it's like, just a time suck. So it's important to know when to cut yourself off from limitless experimentation and uh, deep dives into old work. But no, I'm going to make a book. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to make a book of my photo project 10 years you, later. One thing I wanted to do, uh, I always, I've just been too lazy because it would require too much effort, <laughs> but uh, for a presentation, you know how people, and I hate when they do this, but I've done it myself. They start like a talk at a conference and it's like, a two minute video set to music that probably is going to make you cry or whatever that, uh, you know, it's just your best work or work related to the talk you're about to give. What I thought would be amazing would be create a slideshow either of a, a portfolio of my entire year's worth of work or from a specific wedding and do one slideshow of just awful pictures that I took that I intended to, to be good photos, but just did not work at all. And, and then another slideshow from the exact same wedding or what have you of a curated thing. Yeah, and show, show your people bad work, the, Sam. The difference of not just to show the bad work, but just to show the importance of curation and how it's fine to let to take bad photos. That's all part of the process. What matters is when you know in your you know instinct that you've got what you need to make yourself happy and your client happy uh, as kind of a baseline and and. So that gives you room to experiment more or when you need to kind of rein in that experimentation to hit that baseline or when, uh, oh, totally forgot what I was talking about. Yep. My brain just went, sorry. <laughs> Wait, <laughs> did that actually shows. happen the other day? It did. <laughs> what? You're, yesterday when we were talking with Ryan, you were making a, you we yes, were going to completely left me. Oh yeah. That's a shame. And then I fell asleep for four hours and then it was very gone. I thought yeah, we I were just idea making, about pricing. Making <laughs> I was not joking. That just happens all the time to me mid thought. It'll come back probably <laughs> in like five minutes or but five the, hours. Uh, Who can say? <laughs> yeah. But I think it would, it's not just to show the, uh, that I take bad photos too, but just the, the importance of curation and, um, how that is. I'm going to, just as a side thing, I, I hate, hate slideshows set to music because music is, does so much heavy lifting in, in term, if not more so than the actual photos. Uh, and with video, when people set things to music that is just so beautiful and it's like, yeah, you're getting emotional. Uh, but you didn't write this song. Like this is doing half the work for your photos to make people feel something. Yeah, you chose it and great job choosing the right song to like go with the, the photos. Or whatever, okay, but, but it's also just going to be a Bonnie Vare song. 
right? Like it's probably not, yeah. <laughs> the foreign fields. Uh, there are like six yeah. sad uh, emo. I sat in the That's forest true. and wrote this album. That's so sort true. of things. And yeah. don't get don't get me wrong. But, I love you know, it. as a portfolio of your work as a way to present what you do. I I just it's so cringe to me that half of that experience is so, from some uncredited, uh, you know musician who's okay so anyway sold uh, to this thing so hard, I know, this hard, is a weird thing to complain about but. no hard hard pivot here uh i've been thinking we need to put a video on your website uh, uh just uh, just set to music really you know hammer i do want to embed my behind the scenes video that taylor jackson uh, when he came with me to a wedding i think it's 40 minutes long but i do want to have it either directly embedded or linked to very clearly in my about me because i've had many clients uh i've mentioned it during client meetings and they've watched it after and said that was super helpful and then i've also had many clients do a google search of me and come across it and bring it up during the client meeting also my behind the scenes walk with me reels those have been mentioned proactively from clients uh that it's just very useful to get a wider context of how how i work so i'm not against video but i am against uh okay it's okay bonnie bear yeah. Love that. okay so you saw some you you shot some photos sure that's yeah. i don't know why shot is hard for me to say this morning you shot some okay. photos with... At least you called yourself out and you didn't gloss over it and I didn't have to th- register it in the back of my head as uh, awkward. You're welcome. I, w- yes. I will bring the awkwardness to the front. Uh, we you... shot a ton of headshots. ton of headshots. Oh my God. By the way, it's been a long time since I've used this modifier, but if for anybody out there, God, the Paul C. Buff para- parabolic light modifier, the silver reflective one what? with a the, I'm white sorry. diffuser I need... is so beautiful. No, you need to explain to me like I am five. What <laughs> words did you just use? It's called a PLM. Paul C. Buff is the brand. Uh, the The light I was using is their, it's called their Einstein, which is just a, a plug-in, really powerful, small light that works w- wonderfully. But the, a modifier you can attach to it like an umbrella or a soft box or a strip box or an octa box they make something if you do a quick google search it looks super cool it's called a parabolic uh light modifier and it's uh um or a plm for short i'm trying to look up the exact size that i use there's a bunch of them but the the distinct thing about them is the shape uh, they're really light efficient uh, generally, so you can get a lot of power out of them, which is why a lot of people uh, fixate on them, but or, or like to use them, especially outdoors. But they have a very, depending on the one you use, the the one that uh, is from Paul C. Buff is a very beautiful quality of light that I just ah, it's so good. And so, um, my preference is to use one that's got a silver reflector, kind of like painted into the embed, and the flash doesn't fire through it; it fires into it and then gets reflected back out, and then on. That entire surface, though, you can put a giant white diffuser on top of it. And so if you just start playing around with it, you can kind of peel back an edge of the diffuser. So you get some of the soft diffused light coming through, you know, the majority of what's covering the PLM. But you can also get some spill of like direct, super silvery, contrasty, uh, direct light from the bounce within it's beautiful. That's all I can really sum it up. Nathan bought a similar one that was just a white PLM. So almost like a white umbrella, just huge, 86 inch. And it's very notable how just it's got this painterly look that I'm obsessed with. And so I set that up. Mine's not the 86 inch. I want to say it's probably 48 inches. It's pretty large though, but okay, so beautiful I, light. Headshots, about 50 of them. Sorry, continue. No, I, 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 I love this explanation, but you definitely said PLM like that was a known thing, but I am now Sorry. on Paul C. Buff's website and they have that trademarked. PLM is trademarked by Paul C. Buff. You are. You oh, it are, is. Yeah. TM. I did we not got know a that. TM here, which means that Paul C. Buff is the only one with the, the PLM parabolic light modifier. So no you, way. you're That's just so describing, crazy. you're describing, uh, you know, like a, a constant or a flash reflector, and you used the most niche descriptor for it. <laughs> Sorry, it's um, one of the. 
Yeah, there it is. That's this so looks funny. lovely. I love this. I remember I... getting into the the math of why they design it the way they do, and and the shape, and and like why a parabola even matters, uh, and it's all really fascinating. I think again, it all just kind of comes down to power efficiency. But yeah, it's uh the, one of the great things about Paul C. Buff as a company compared to like Profoto and uh, what is it Edelkron? No, not Edelkron. The it, whatever that other e brand is e i n something so affordable it's 500 bucks for like their flash like the einstein which is a really great flash and then all the modifiers are so freaking cheap so uh, i had a little bit of budget when i worked at the press club and i was developing my headshots kind of rig that i wanted to use for some of the celebrity portraits and i just i bought one of everything they had i sent a lot of them back but i kept many of them as well and just to get familiar with why I would use an Octobox versus um, a PLM versus an Umbrella and also just all the setup trade-offs and power trade-offs, all that kind of stuff. It's very, very fun, good place to start if you're on a budget and have no idea what modifier type that you want. Get that PLM. down am Silver reflector, by the way. Yeah. And it still looks good, even if you don't use the white diffuser uh, in front of that. It's, it's almost like a super intense beauty dish vibe so whoever is listening to this you missed my eyes glazing over about two minutes ago while i continued Sorry. to click through policybuff.com that sounds that's just not a good name for a no company. it's the founder who actually passed away so they could probably oh. just undo that <laughs> r.i.p yeah. but like let's I think they are um, Tennessee-based, I want to say, Nashville-based company. They're very they proud of that. <laughs> That's all I remember. How are the? How is the mirror? Yeah. Good. Awesome. Way too low quality of glass, but the, the thing that I used to... Uh, for you oh, oh, for everyone. Yeah, you, okay. it needs to be much, much higher quality. Uh, not only do you, it, with this glass that I bought not only do you, you lose uh, some stops of light because it's you're shooting through something that's making it all darker, but it's hate, it's like soft and it's like shooting through a slight gray haze. So that's not good. I have another one that I, I don't think I want to affix the filter to because it's a permanent thing. It did hold very well and it was useful. Like everybody found it useful that I held it up and let them see themselves in. It works. The method works. It's just the quality of the uh, shooting through the glass wasn't good enough. So I need to do more research. I also think the circular shape's the way to go. I have another one, like I mentioned, that is rectangular. I just can't decide if I want to permanently affix the filter mount to it or not. Really easy to mount. And I also think the size that I got was, was a good size. It weighs like nothing. I think higher quality glass is going to add a little more weight. But yeah, freaking works. And I got a lot of questions about it from people who had no understanding of what the point was or what I was going for. And then other people that were like, sign me up, I would buy that. We also got some good feedback about our photographer pants. Oh yeah? What are yeah. our, what's our feedback for our photographer pants? Somebody said, uh, you guys just described motocross pants. So get those. I was like, no, you missed the point. First of all, almost all of those, as I researched, have giant, ugly logos. Terrible all, logos. They still need to look a little, like dressy enough to get away with wearing at a wedding that you need to kind of be, you know, at least thoughtful and how you're dressed and not wearing like cargo pants so but and you don't you don't need knee pads to, for actual physical protection as if you're falling off of a motorcycle <laughs> or getting you know like road rash from falling off a motorcycle you just need a simple i would think almost uh like my little lens cloth here it's very soft it's not even thick i bet this would be enough to protect your knee against an uncomfortable ground that you're leaning on you, you don't need a huge yeah, we're not putting in plastic like real graded yeah, thing we're exactly. putting in like a layer of denim or something right like a thick... and it needs to breathe for comfort i don't think motocross pants are you know they're not catching the wind in any pleasing way they're, you're like it's like a, you're sewn up in there <laughs> so that was uh interesting feedback but uh, yeah the thing itself would be very easy to to make and put it out into the world if we ever want to figure how does out it, how. how do we how does it work for setting it down like did you notice you, that you had to treat your camera weird you're worried totally about fine. it breaking whatever i was worried about it breaking but that's why i set it down a bunch just to see 
if it would. And did it you set it on the filter? Mm -hmm. That's yeah. Crazy. So it's just kind of like leaning up. But here's the other thing I was thinking about because I wasn't perfect in centering it. I didn't even try. I just eyeballed like the center where to mount the filter relative to everything. And it was off a little bit. I was like, oh, that's annoying. But then I was like, wait a second. If you had asked you me to do that, could, I could have gotten it right me. because of my thing. vibes with gallery walls. If it is an issue, sure, you would vibe it into perfection. <laughs> vibe it into like place. <laughs> <laughs> vibe it into place. The uh, I think you could actually mount it. So if this is the the one way two way mirror, you can mount it so that it, it's actually just here. And so you could put your camera down, and the bottom of the lens itself would be resting on the lens, just like normal. Because there's no reason it needs to be centered. It's just yeah. a reflective glass. I mean, it might be a little annoying for people that like balance <laughs> but all that matters is that the person can see themselves while you're photographing through it it would expose the bottom of your camera and maybe your hands to the person being photographed because uh, right now the centered the way that it is it actually really covers the entire uh, basically the entirety of the camera from the subject's visual which i think is a nice way to disconnect from oh yeah i'm getting a photo done this is scary also can i just say going through that many headshots back to back of uh this was for Headshots for an organization that literally they set security standards for, um, like, I forgot what it's called, PCI security standards. I don't know. It's a bunch of people from like Apple and Microsoft and PayPal, uh, slightly nerdier folks, if you will. Uh, it's just so funny to me how the process of being photographed, how nervous it makes people, and how getting them to do the most basic things is difficult. I have, an, I have an X on the ground for them to stand. Okay, come over here. Uh, oh, you, you can keep your name tag on. Keep it in your hand. I need to get a picture of your name tag next to your face. They proceed to put the name tag down and not stand on the X. I'm like, oh, no, can you grab your name tag? I need a ticket. Okay, sure. And so they put it back on fully. I'm like, no, just hold it up to your face for one photo just so I can see who you are so I know later what your name to your face is. And then maybe then they'll actually get it and do it. And then I'll grab it from them. And they're like confused as to why I took it out of their hand. And I'm like, this whole process of like getting in a routine was so funny because no matter what kind of way I tried to, sorry, my cat just scared me. She's not usually up here. while I'm No matter what kind of routine or way that I tried to refine the experience. So that it was really frictionless and like people would get what I was saying. Never just, the simple request, stand there, right there on the X. It's like they would back away from I, it actively. I have a so way to solve this for you. And I apologize that you didn't complain to me in the moment because I could have solved a headache for you. Okay. Do What's not, up? whenever you're setting up for group headshots, do not use an X. Use a T. Okay. You put a tape T where you want so you you have the back line that is what their heels go against mm -hmm. the straight line uh is the line that you want them looking down so you they put their heels against mm. the tape with the line that they're supposed to be looking down uh between okay. their feet and people can understand that X's freak people out because they think they need to stand exactly in the center and then they're like, oh, am I doing it right? A T gives them the literal box to put their feet in. It makes in. sense. And I have uh, that. I have no doubt there's a, probably a dozen other things that, but it was a fun experiment to just see yeah. unfold and, and how as people can't no celebrate Process. celebrate my incredible a, a, tea it is a great idea Thank i love you. that i will register All that. Right. no no i and, and other headshot photographers probably have like three or four other recommendations about how to set up a physical space so that it's more inviting or, or more comfortable or more obvious where people need to go just the nerves of a asking somebody to do something so simple uh and and see that it not it was hitting a wall because they were so fixated on the nervousness of being photographed because headshots can be very scary for some people i'd say yeah probably 90 percent of the people that would, would come in uh had that kind of mental block which is really fascinating i mean it's easy to set people at ease that's where i eventually hit my stride with everyone of like asking them to make adjustments and I do that and get them comfortable so that they naturally smile do you but, gas them up i gas people up I compliment everything about him. Oh, sure. Yeah. Okay. Problem was, I, after the first few, I started to get a little bored, and I was trying to make jokes that just nobody understood. 
that happens to me all the time. I kept talking about how this was in front of a green screen and I just kept coming up with funny scenarios to green screen behind them and they just did not get it. <laughs> that was mostly just me. The, the last 30 minutes of shooting was me giggling behind the camera at myself. That's literally you just talking to yourself at that point. Yeah. Like, Pretty much. Oh, I'm going to put in something silly into. behind you anyway. Thanks for letting me take your photo. <laughs> Uh, so but they, mirror but filter. They, did you pick okay a win filter mirror filter a win yes right. well a loss process and concept the materials still yet to be work in progress work in progress yeah Huzzah. it's good timing for that like i said i don't remember the last time i did headshots and the podcast before i have to do these we in you know invent create this product yeah. that's crazy i prefer the word invent it makes me feel smarter and yeah. I could use that this week, you know? This this smoke has got me down, my brain, not good. Yeah. You know, I'm actually um, surprised. I, I remember mentioning to my mom, because I was like, oh, she's three hours further south. And the last time this happened, I asked if they had any issues. It, it seems like it didn't affect them that further south. And uh, I was like, yeah, the weather is going to, says it's supposed to clear up after like three days. I was like, but wait a second, that's weird. Because fire just keeps burning. And it makes sense that winds would shift and carry smoke into maybe other areas. But it seems like it would it would be a long, drawn-out process of gradual clarity or winds shifting back and forth. And, uh, you know, once the fires finally go out up in Canada, guys, in October. On that, in October, whenever, I know everyone's, like, freaked out and annoyed that it's back. But if it's literal fire causing the issue, which it is, it, yeah, that seems about right to me. You know, it's really odd. I've been traveling so much, so I'm really out of my daily routine of exercise, at least more than I want to be. And every day, every single time that it's like, stay inside, do not exercise outside, that is the one day I really want to go for a run. Don't do it. <laughs> for whatever reason. Don't do it. As soon as I can't do something, Just slap that is the a, only slap thing a mask on and get out there. You'll have a great time. Yeah. I'm used to that from the like two weeks I tried to run with a mask in early COVID times. Yeah, it's not fun. It was a, or the mask that I would have on my neck so that if I did pass somebody, I could put it on and then take it back off. I was like, ugh, remember those early days? That was great. I do. I remember them well. Okay, <sighs> so uh, anything else new for you? Any other self-portrait revelations? No, man, I'm just... I mean, this was this was a bad week. I mean, like, this this mm. smoke wrecked me because uh, we, lost, we lost an entire summer when we were living in Montana to wildfire smoke. Where we really? just couldn't go out. Yeah, we couldn't go outside from mid June yeah. till September. Like, do you actually smell it in the air? Or yeah. Is it just you feel the effects? Okay. I smell yeah. it in the air. I feel it in my eyes. I have a mild headache, and like I'm, I have mm. a predisposition to migraines. Uh, so I get like a migraine once or twice a week, um, and smoke Whoa, makes so it sorry. three or four. Uh, yeah, it's not great. Um, and so you know, like. Plus, bodies keep score, so I'm, uh, you know, like seeing this, like this smoke coming back. Is that a book? Yeah. Is that a book? It, it's okay. a book about how your body remembers trauma, and you have a trauma response when you're uh, active, re-experiencing something. So you can, uh, okay. so like this smoke is significantly worse for me because of the trauma response that I'm having from losing an entire summer in sure. uh 2018 then you know you losing your first summer of 2023 so next year when the smoke comes back you will feel as bad as i feel this year and i will can't wait love Great. the body i love that it keeps score thanks guys uh <laughs> so i've just been like in a terrible mood and my brain hasn't worked great and my mm -hmm. partner's been gone so i've been taking a daily self-portrait and i haven't been feeling it and I'm tired, and I'm going to keep doing that all weekend. I might even redesign a friend's website for them, you know, fix up their fix up their stuff, make them a logo. I don't know. I don't know. That's pretty cool. I love it. Yeah. Well, that's we can, so, okay. You're going to you're yeah. going to you're going to have spent like $20,000 and a year and a half redesigning your website and I'm going to redesign someone's website in a weekend. A weekend. It's true. I am waiting. You know, I'm not spending 20 grand, but I am waiting on the, the first series of revisions from my attempt. I really need the mobile stuff built out. The guy who does the coding is on a two-week vacation, which I think he's coming back from soon. I'm not in any rush. 
I'm, I'm in a rush my for website it, yeah. as is right now. It works, but it would be nice to get that off my plate because I have a lot of editing to do. That is what I am planning. So, yeah, between now and the next time we record, I will have just been editing constantly. Wow, that's grim. Yeah, sorry for your yeah. loss. It's okay. <laughs> Well, this is exciting. I'm glad that we got some feedback. I'm glad that our bodies are continuing to keep score, etc. <laughs> LOL. All right. Well, take it easy. Right. Uh, you, did you have your morning ice cream today? I did. I feel like you did not. You did. I did. It just wasn't didn't very even much. Mention it. Oh, okay. Well, we need to work on that. Yeah. What I need is a second coffee. I need. I need. Okay. And I'm going to roll into second coffee. I'm going to have a burrito. My life is going to improve. Ooh, that sounds great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I've really been enjoying are the low-carb mission brand tortillas. They are excellent. Net, I think it's like three net carbs per tortilla, and they taste exactly like normal tortillas. Does this just I become taste. a macros podcast? We're we talking about lifting. <laughs> Uh, I don't lift, but I do, I do monitor my carb intake quite heavily. And I used to calorie count everything, everything that I ate. I don't do that anymore, but yeah. Anytime there's a, a good carb, high fiber carb offset, uh, solution that actually works. I like to mention it cause it can be sort of a difficult thing to find. And I freaking love tortillas with just one slice of American cheese melted in the middle. That is my nighttime snack. Two tortillas with cheese. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wait, that's two like, tortillas. Two tortillas. One slice? Two slices of cheese. Two slices. No, no, no. Okay. Yeah. They're just each. They're, they're just two separate things that I eat. Oh. It's one thing that I eat two of. Wait, you okay. don't like, so you do melt them or you don't melt them? I do melt them. So you make a little quesadilla? Kind of, but it's rolled up like a. Like a cheese roll. Yeah. Yeah. It's the best. It's the best. Nothing else. Just, Yeah. It's pretty basic. I just, it's a, I grew up eating those. You should so get a little Taco Bell sauce. Make a snack. Like one of the little bottles and have a little yeah, cup. I don't want to overcomplicate. I want to keep it easy. Dude. But it used to be a very specific tortilla that I liked and Kraft Singles back, uh, you know, uh, cheese. And, and now uh, I'm able to have something with way fewer carbs and it tastes just as good. Congratulations. So I'm going to go eat that now. <laughs> <laughs> this got weird. Okay. Well, I appreciate you. Bye, buddy. Appreciate you. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah.